Good morning and welcome to our talk today on the basics of Buddhism. This is the second to the last lecture in the series. The last lecture will be on the great lessons of the Buddha. And so today's lecture is really a primer for the lessons to come to help us understand a little bit about who is the Buddha and what are the origins of this remarkable faith tradition. Buddhism is the world's fourth largest religion with over 520 million followers. As you can see, we've had a progression from discussing about Christianity, the world's largest religion, to Islam, the world's second largest religion, to then Hinduism, the world's third largest religion, and now Buddhism, the world's fourth largest religion. Buddhism is an Indian religion that encompasses a variety of traditions, beliefs, and spiritual practices, largely based on the original teachings of the Buddha and then the ways that the Buddha lived his life. There are many wonderful philosophies associated with Buddhism, and most people would say to you that Buddhism in and of itself is less of a religion and more of a philosophy. It's very important to understand Buddhism in light of how one lives and what are the central tenets of this message because for many people, a religion is, fo is focused on a god, something that transcends our existence. No such thing exists in Buddhism. This is about coming to know one's true and sacred self. Buddhism originated in India between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE, spreading through much of Asia. So here we will see that about the same time that the Hebrew Scriptures, the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Hebrew Scriptures were being written, that Buddhism was beginning. So we see these similarities, and I hope that you will be able to see them clearly. I'll point out some of these similarities, but what's wonderful to recognize is that at this period of time, about four or five to six centuries before Common Era, this was a time of, re of remarkable religious thought development. All Buddhist traditions share the goal of overcoming suffering and ending the cycle of death and rebirth. This is central to your understanding of Buddhism, that all of life is suffering and that our goal should be first and foremost to eliminate suffering, not only in our lives, but in the lives of every living creature. How do we do this? Well, we can do it by attainment of nirvana or through the path of the Buddha. Buddhist schools vary in their interpretation of the path to liberation, placing priority on certain Buddhist texts, texts or on certain practices, but there is no one particular way to achieve nirvana or enlightenment. Now let's talk briefly about the Buddha or the enlightened one. The man who was to become the Buddha was born about 2,600 years ago, so 600 years before Christ, and his name was Siddhartha Gautama. He was a prince in a small territory of what is now the Indian-Nepalese border area. He was raised in tremendous comfort. He had everything that he needed, all of the material comforts that one could expect of a young prince, and yet, the one thing he could not find was contentment. No material pleasure could satisfy him. For those of you who are trying to draw a parallel right now, uh, for those of you from the Catholic Christian tradition, I would draw your attention to St. Francis of Assisi, a young man who had all of these same comforts coming from a wealthy merchant class family, and yet unable to find happiness. And the parallels between the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, and St. Francis of Assisi are tremendous. He left home at the age of 29, almost similar to the age that Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30, to search for a deeper meaning 
in the secluded forests and mountains. For the first time, when he left these areas and he came to the cities, he saw poverty, misery, and illness. His parents and family had sheltered him from all of these things. He had grown up not knowing that the world was a place of suffering. And yet, he felt this suffering deep inside because he was disconnected from the very things that gave him meaning. He had everything, and yet he recognized he had nothing. And then he saw others who were tortured by misery, by illness, by poverty, and he began, began to develop his concepts. So he thought, what I need to do is to abandon all of these ways that have brought me so many good things. I need to live a life of asceticism, of denying myself the basic com comforts. He studied under the wisest religious teachers and philosophers of his, of his time, learning all they had to offer, but found that it wasn't enough. Place after place he would go, school after school, teacher after teacher, he would learn what they knew and adapt it. And yet while they had found truth, they had found contentment and found their place, he discovered that it still wasn't enough for him. He traveled the path of self-mortification, taking that practice to the extremes of asceticism, but he could not find the truth in what he sought. Siddhartha discovered that there needed to be a different way. It wasn't the way of extreme wealth, and it wasn't the way of extreme poverty. What he would find is it would be the middle way. At the age of 35, on the full moon night of May, he sat beneath the branches of the Bodhi tree and contemplated his existence, contemplated the meaning of his life, and engaged his mind in deep and soulful meditation for 40 days and 40 nights. He found himself under this tree, searching for the meanings of his mind, the universe, and life itself. We find again this connection to 40 days. Moses went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments for 40 days and 40 nights. He led his people in the desert for 40 years. Jesus spent time alone considering the message that his father had given him that you are my son upon whom my favor rests. He spent 40 days and 40 nights considering this. And here again, we see someone who is to become the Buddha spending 40 days and 40 nights alone, considering, contemplating the message of what he was to become and what that would mean for the world. During his search, during this time, he gained supreme enlightenment, an immersion in peace, and an end to suffering. From that moment on, he was known as the Buddha. This enlightenment was not a revelation from some divine being, this wasn't a connection from God, and this is where we start to see this divergence. That what the Buddha wasn't doing was listening to messages from God. He made of himself a discovery based on the deepest kind of meditation and the clearest experience of the mind. What he came to know was his truest self. After enlightenment, he no longer felt the effects of craving, anger, and delusion. The teachings of the Buddha are remarkable. For those of you who have a chance to read some of the basic principles of Buddhism, I encourage you to do so. Before I talk about this, so I want to draw your attention to the visual because this connects us all the way back to ancient Egypt, if you can believe it. Take a look at the other people in this drawing and notice that they do not have anything surrounding their head. Now take a look at the Buddha and you will notice that he has what seems to be the outline of a flame. If you will look at pictures of Muhammad, you will see the same idea of flames around his head that distinguishes him as a person who gives light. 
This comes to us from the ancient Egyptians when they would want to signify that someone was aligned with the sun god Ra, they would show the sun above them, the disk of Aten. And then later on, Christians adopted this as the halo, that this very sun disk would now drop to being right behind their head, and it would signify to them that they were indeed aligned with God the Father, and that they were special, that their message was one of enlightenment, one of bringing light and bringing peace. And so we see now throughout history this idea of marking a person who is set aside in the eyes of God and in the eyes of faith by showing this disc or halo of light around them. Now, this is known as more of an aura in the case of the Buddha, that there would be a light that would emanate from him. And many people have said that someone who finds this level of enlightenment, it's not just something that they feel, that in many respects it's something that you can see the light around this person. The teachings about the path that the Buddha went on are called the Dharma. We see this again as an extension of Hinduism, the path, the way. Here, dharma literally means the nature of all things or the truth underlying existence. Such a small word for such a huge concept. The truth underlying existence. The Buddha died in 483 BCE. Upon his death, he passed into a state of nirvana, which is the ultimate release from suffering in which the self no longer exists and salvation is achieved. Salvation from what? Salvation from suffering, from the release from suffering. Included in his last breaths were four words of inspiration. Strive on with awareness. After the Buddha died, small communities of monks and nuns began to develop along the paths where the Buddha had taught, and they began to spread his message and to teach what he had taught. His followers were dressed in yellow or orange robes today and wandered the countryside to meditate quietly. For almost 200 years, these humble disciples were overshadowed by the dominant Hindu believers. Keep in mind that this was in India. So much like the gospel of Jesus Christ was given to Jews first, this message eventually had to spread because the Jews reject, rejected the ideas and the concepts of Jesus. Here, too, the same thing. The Buddha came with this message and brought his message to all Hindu followers so that they could follow, but many of these dominant uh, Hindu areas simply rejected him. And so he had to leave. He went elsewhere. His followers went elsewhere, I should say. But the rise of a great empire changed all of that. In the 3rd century BCE, several ambitious leaders built the expansive Mauryan Empire. One king named Ashoka was distressed by the amount of killing and domination that happened among societies, that he was concerned about this idea that why must we continue to dominate people and hurt and kill in order to put our message forth. So, adopting a code of nonviolence, he renounced all warfare and incorporated principles of Buddhism into his practice. We see again another similarity to Christianity that the early days of Jesus' message for the first Christian followers through the first 300 years, that they were considered to be the cult of Jesus. It really didn't go very far until the Roman Emperor Constantine decided that the Christian message was the one true message. He went into battle bearing the Christian standard and said when he came from this battle victorious, he said that from now on, Christianity would be the religion of the Roman Empire. And at that moment, Constantine changed the Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire. So again, we see the power and importance of one man, not just Jesus, but Constantine. And here again, we see this comparison we see Ashoka taking the message of the Buddha and bringing it to the world, spreading this message. That if not for Ashoka, the message of Buddhism might have met its end shortly after the Buddha passed.
But this message continued to spread because of the dominant, the dominant belief of one man and his power. Ashoka promoted Buddhist expansion by sending monks to surrounding territories to teach the message of the Buddha. A wave of conversion began and Buddhism spread not only through India, but also internationally. You can see here the spread of Buddhism in a relatively short period of time. Keep in mind, again, the same thing happened after the death of Muhammad, that Islam was spread because they sent out people to spread this message and to bring the message of Islam. The same thing here happened again, that if it wasn't for a concentrated effort at this period to send this message out, it would have lived and died a small regional message. With the spread of Buddhism, its traditional practices and philosophies became redefined and regionally distinct. So again, we don't see one head or leader here. We see this message being spread out across many territories. And only a small group of these Buddhists be, uh, continued to practice the original teachings. And as a whole, Buddhism began to fade inside of India. It spread elsewhere, but began to fade inside of India. And some of the tenets that we know of Hinduism today were actually Buddhist principles that were reabsorbed into the tolerant Hindu faith. Buddhism is also known as the way of inquiry. Buddhism suggests that you should never believe just what you hear from one source alone. Blind faith is not the way of the faithful. Inquiry, enlightenment should always be our path. We should be in the constant seek, on the constant lookout for that which is truth. In one of his best known sermons, the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha pointed out the danger in predicating one beliefs merely on hearsay, tradition, popularity, authority of ancient scriptures, on the word of a supernatural being, or out of trust in one's teachers, parents, or pretty much anyone. He covered the whole gamut here for us, didn't he? He didn't leave anything out. He said if someone's telling you something, you should probably be suspicious. Think about why they're telling you. And continue to search for yourself for the message that resonates in your heart and connects with your mind. He would say that when one has a view that is tolerant and teaches tolerance, but a view that agrees with your expression and makes you happy, but also makes other, happies, other people happy and doesn't harm them, if it leads all people to happiness, then this should be the message that you consider and embrace as your own faith. The traveler on the way of inquiry should practice tolerance. This, for me, is perhaps the most important part of this lecture. Primarily because as a young man who thought that he knew everything, as every young man does, this is why they put young men into battle, because they don't consider their own mortality. They certainly can't begin to think about anything beyond their current existence. Sometimes when I'm traveling with my son, who is now 21, but when he was 18, he and I traveled for a bit, and I would give my lectures, and I would tell people, if you're seeking answers, don't ask me. Ask my 18-year-old son, because he knows everything. <laughs> Just ask him. And now, as he goes away to school and he comes back home, he has more questions, and he has more respect for what he doesn't understand, and so begins the development in maturity. Tolerance doesn't mean that we have to embrace everything, but it does mean that we don't get angry at what we can't accept. How often today are we angry at ourselves and at each other for things that we don't understand? Think for a moment of politics. <laughs> we become angry because we don't understand. It's not that we understand each other, it's that we don't seek first to understand. And what is one of the basic principles of even Franciscan theology, which is seek first to understand. And when we understand, it builds compassion 
It builds empathy. And even more importantly, or equally important here, on our own journey is the idea that we don't have any idea where this life will take us and to where it will lead us. But further along the journey, we may find someone who enlightens us to such an extent that the views that we once held as sacred, we no longer believe, or the views that we once thought were foolish, we now find reason. So to be careful of being too judgmental, of throwing away ideas too quickly, because you stop yourself dead on the path from enlightenment, that we should be open and tolerant of all ideas and seek first understanding. The Buddha set forth four noble truths. And these noble truths are important for us to understand also in concept of how he understood God and divinity. He believed that there was really no need to discuss the ideas of God or where we came from or where we're going. He said that this was a search for absolutely unimportant information. And he compared this to the story of a man who was shot by a poisoned arrow. And the man who was shot by a poisoned arrow says, hey, where did this arrow come from? Who made the arrow and who shot it? Much like we who are engaged in daily struggles with suffering, we look around our world and we can't help but see the suffering and the misery of people around us and we ask, where do we come from? Who created all of this? And where do we go when we die? The Buddha would say to us, these are insignificant, unimportant questions. And even more so, you're not qualified to ask these questions because you're not yet smart enough to understand the answer and what it implies. And he said that this foolish man who asked about who had been shot by this poison arrow and was asking all these questions about where the arrow was made and who shot it, died before he could get the answers to his questions and before it made any difference whatsoever. In the same way, the Buddha said, the urgent need of our existence is to find relief, lasting relief from recurrent suffering, which robs us of happiness and leaves us in strife. How different is this message from many other religious faiths who focus on worshiping God. Here we see the Buddha saying, let's not worry about such things. When you look around and you see people suffering and you know yourself to be suffering recurrently, what is it that we suffer from? This is the question. What causes suffering? What causes us misery and unhappiness? Shouldn't we be seeking the answers to this question first? And that is, is the foundational principle of understanding Buddhism. Philosophical speculations are of secondary importance and are best left until after one has developed his mind enough, trained in meditation, to the stage where one has the ability to examine the matter clearly and find the truth for oneself. How many of us engage daily in thinking about the truth? and seeking the truth. How many of our arguments are centered on finding the truth? I'm constantly drawn when I'm in the middle of a discussion with someone, and I change the word discussion, sometimes it ends up being an argument, but that's my fault. When I'm involved in a discussion with someone and I find myself getting angry, I realize at that moment I'm no longer interested in the truth. What I'm doing is building an argument to defend myself and my ego. Because the search for the truth requires no ego and demands no self. It's seeking that which is right, that which is truthful. And when we start to feel angry about something, we're no longer interested in finding the truth. We're interested in preserving our ego. And so this idea of seeking the truth is meant once someone has found the way to relieve suffering. The central teaching of the Buddha around which all other teachings revolve is the Four Noble Truths. 
and they are quite simply, that all forms of being, human and otherwise, are afflicted with suffering. We look around, it doesn't take much to see suffering in our world. That the cause of this suffering is desire, born of the illusion of a soul. Here we see the distinctive departure from Hinduism. That Hinduism said we have an Atman, a soul, an individual soul that is part of Brahman, the universal soul. And Buddhism says this is what causes suffering because you desire something. And when we desire something, what is the root of this desire? It's a recognition that we want something that we don't have. What is desire? It's wanting something. You don't want something you already have, but there is the key to happiness. And so the key to happiness is not in wanting, in receiving what you want. The key to happiness is in desiring that which you already have. Imagine what a world this would be if we could all want what we already have and be content with that. That this suffering born of an illusion of a soul, thinking that there's something beyond this current present existence, has a lasting end in the experience of enlightenment, that if you seek enlightenment, that this suffering will end. It has an end in enlightenment. But that we have to let go of the idea of the soul and all consequent desire and aversion will fade away. That this peaceful and blissful enlightenment is achieved through gradual training, a path that is called the middle way and the eightfold path. Here's what gets most of us. The gradual training. All of us are looking, whether it's for a diet or a fitness program or the confession on the deathbed, we're looking for the quick and easy way to enlightenment, to understanding, and to a path towards salvation. And what the Buddha says to us is, no such thing exists. You don't become wealthy by deciding that you're going to become wealthy in the morning and you find wealth overnight. You become wealthy by living frugally, shrewdly, working hard and saving. And in the same way, you don't attain salvation or enlightenment by thinking about it and wishing it so. You have to discipline your mind to the message of salvation. Buddhism openly recognizes the truth of life's many suffering and offers an end to suffering through reflection, meditation, and following the path to enlightenment in this life, not the next. The middle way is also known as the Eightfold Path. The way to end all suffering is called the middle way because it avoids the two extremes of wealth and poverty. Only when the body is reasonably comfortable, when you have most things that you need, when you have the food, you have shelter, you have clothing, then you can focus on this middle way, on this path. The middle way consists in diligent cultivation of virtue, meditation, and wisdom. And here is the Buddha's eightfold path. Strive for right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Do you know where most of us get messed up? Before we even get started. Right understanding. We get caught up with the idea of assuming that our understanding is intrinsically right because it's our own. We don't question whether or not we're wrong. We don't generally enter into an argument thinking that we might be wrong. We generally don't enter into a discussion even considering that we might be wrong. And so consequently, when our minds are closed to seeing the possibility of truth from another, we can never begin with the right understanding. And so it's this right understanding, this right intention that leads us to right thought and right action. And here we see at the top, the first couple are wisdom, the second few are ethics, and then we talk about concentration. 
These are the important things to consider on the Eightfold Path. Now, I'm going to talk with you briefly about 10 non-virtuous actions, and I'd like for you to think if you can see a comparison to any other scripture that might cover this same information. And consider that these were developed at almost the exact same time in human history. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. We see here these same concepts developed at about the same time as Moses came down from the mountain. And so the question becomes, why? They were trying to create societies based on law and order. Moses was doing the exact same thing. When he came down the mountain with these commandments, he looked to a group of people who were all around him worshiping different gods and idols. And here again we see this idea that people are still distracted by wealth, by other gods, and he's saying, here's how you need to amend your lives. Here's how you need to focus your attention on body, speech, and mind and see how they perfectly align with the Ten Commandments. Virtue, without virtue, it is impossible to perfect meditation. You need to first seek the virtuous way. You need to want to be a good person and to want to live in a world of beauty. Without perfecting meditation, it's impossible to arrive at enlightenment. We can't have the things that we want without taking the time to dedicate ourselves to it. You can't be calm every single day unless you decide in advance how you're going to respond to difficult situations. If you see someone who's calm around you at all times, this person is calm because they're unsurprised by what's happening to them. They've already anticipated the anger and the frustrations of their day, and they've decided in advance that this is how they're going to respond. It's only with great meditation, with time spent in considerable thought and considerable effort paid to our responsibility to ourselves and others that we can achieve wisdom. And then this wisdom is our gift to the world. The Buddhist path is a gradual path, a middle way consisting of virtue, meditation, and wisdom, as explained in the Noble Eightfold Path, leading to happiness and liberation. And what's important to consider here is that this path isn't just for other people. This is the key Buddhists to believe, Buddhists believe, to our own personal happiness and fulfillment that if you want to be happy, this is the path. The law of karma is also strong within Buddhism. It implies that we cannot escape the results of our actions. There are deeds of body, speech, or mind that bring harm to yourself, to others, and both. Such deeds are called bad karma. So these deeds are usually motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion. Again, why are we greedy? Because we desire something. Why do we hate? Because we haven't sought proper understanding. And why are we deluded? Because we think that there's something that exceeds and transcends this existence. Because they bring painful results, they should be avoided. Now, good karma are those things which bring well-being to ourselves and to others. This is called good karma, and they're generally motivated by generosity, compassion, or wisdom, which are the fruits of a thoughtful, virtuous life. They bring happy results and these should be done as often as possible. Much of what one experiences is the result of one's thoughts and actions and the karma they generate. So this isn't about some God bringing harm to you or causing problems because of original sin. Much of what you experience in your life is because of what you think and what you do. This philosophy places the responsibility for one's life squarely on the shoulders of the person living it. If you're looking for someone to blame, Buddhism is not for you. But if you can be honest with yourself and take a good look in the mirror every morning, 
and ask yourself, how can I bring joy? How can I minimize someone else's suffering? And don't just turn around at that moment, but sit down and reflect on your responsibility to achieve those for yourself and for others. Then you might have the makings to be a good Buddhist. You reap what you sow in the eyes of Buddhism. The Buddha states that no being whatsoever, divine or otherwise, has any power to stop the consequences of good or bad karma. There is no divinity, and if there was, no divinity has any power to stop the power of your actions. The fact that one reaps just what one sows gives a greater incentive to avoid all forms of, forms of bad karma and to do good instead. Though one cannot escape the results of bad karma, one can lessen their effect. And I love this analogy. We should strive as much as possible to do good. But let's be honest. We've all done our share of bad things. And we will pay the price in the eyes of karma, in the eyes of Buddhism, for those actions. But we can minimize this karma by constantly doing good. And much like a spoonful of salt in a small glass of water is going to make that water salty, if we have a lake full of our good intentions and our good actions, that little bit of salt certainly won't alter the taste of that water. And so it should be with our lives that if we constantly strive to do good, that these negative failings in our lives, the things that we have done that we regret, won't alter the path of the bad karma, but they will minimize its impact in our lives. This natural law of karma becomes the force behind and reason for the practice of morality and compassion in our society. We want good for ourselves, and we want good for others. So do unto others as you would do unto me. Merit transfer is a really interesting concept that we would also see in the idea of almsgiving. So a person accumulates merit not only through intentions and ethical living, but by exchanging goods and services through giving to charity to monks or nuns. So a person can transfer your good karma to you by giving. So if you give money to a monk or to a nun, all that they're doing is spending their entire day praying, right? Being good, being wise, being virtuous. They can transfer some of that to you by giving. So we see where this developed, right? How do monks and nuns eat and survive? Well, they can't survive on prayer alone. They need bread, they need water, they need clothes. And so people who are engaged in business but also want to live virtuous lives, you still have to live a virtuous life. You still have to do good things. But every once in a while, if you give some money to a monk to help them eat, that some of that good rubs off on you, right? That's a merit transfer, it's called. So we can achieve more merit. We can achieve more good karma by doing good for others. And really, that's true to what we believe. When we give, we're doing good for others. We're giving from what we have, from what we've worked hard for, to give to someone who doesn't have. Rebirth is an interesting concept. The Buddha remembered many of his past lives, and many significant Buddhist leaders remember past lives. Such a strong memory comes, they say, from deep meditation. For those who remember their, <coughs> excuse me, their past life, <coughs> rebirth puts this life in a meaningful perspective. The law of karma is best understood as a framework of many lifetimes because it may take many lifetimes for this karma to fully work itself out. Karma, again, helps explain the inequalities of birth, how some people are born into poor circumstances while others are born into wealthy and advantaged and privileged lifestyles. The effects of bad karma are not regarded at a, as a punishment for evil deeds, but as lessons from which to learn. And here we see another departure from Buddhism. 
And I encourage all of us to open our eyes to see the truth of this. When one is born among the poor, it teaches the need for generosity. Not that you deserve to be poor, but what is the lesson that we should take away by seeing someone who's poor? It teaches the need for generosity. When one is born with a disability, it teaches the need for compassion. Not that this person was born with a disability as a punishment for a past life, but that it's meant to teach us about the need for compassion. That everything that we encounter in the world has a lesson for us. I've always believed that the best relationships are those that allow us to be both teacher and student. That in any good relationship, we have something to teach and we have something to learn. And that in any good relationship, we should seek to fulfill both of those roles. And here we see the same, that it we're called upon to see both sides of this lesson. Rebirth takes place within many realms. There are many heavenly realms and grim lower realms. Looks pretty familiar to those of you who have read Dante's Inferno. The three good realms, heavenly demigod and human, the three evil realms, animal, hungry ghosts, and hellish realm. Human beings can go to any of these realms in this life and, or in the next life, and we can come from any of these realms into our present life. Understanding that we come and go between these realms helps us develop compassion and respect for beings in these realms. It's unlikely, for example, that you would see a Buddhist exploiting animals because they might be that in the next life or they might have come from that in a past life. In Asian and Tibetan Buddhism, rebirth is not instantaneous and there's an intermediate stage. We might call this in our terms for those of you who are Christian or Catholic, uh, purgatory. The Orthodox Theravada position rejects this weight and says that rebirth is immediate and instantaneous. In Buddhism, there is no creator God, no priest, or any other being who has the power to interfere in the working of someone's karma. Buddhism teaches that the individual alone must take responsibility for your actions. If you want to be wealthy, you should be trustworthy, diligent, and frugal, and such is the way to wealth. If you want to live in a heavenly realm, you should always be kind to others. In Buddhism, there is no God to pray for, no God to grant you favors. Nothing interferes with the workings of karma. When Buddhists are asked if they believe in a supreme being who created the universe, they may ask first, which universe? For those of you who have seen the new telescope that is able to peer into the universe, a, a position, a, a piece about the size of the tip end of your thumb when held up to the nighttime sky. When the telescope is focused on that, it can see almost infinite universes, hundreds of thousands of universes and galaxies. And so the question isn't whether or not there was a creator God that created this universe, but which universe? All of them? Our universe is only one among countless millions in Buddhist cosmology. And today, we know that there are literally billions and billions of galaxies and universe. After one universe cycle ends, another begins again and again. A creator God is redundant in such a scheme. No being is a savior because whether God, human, animal, plant, or mineral, all are subject to the law of karma. Even the Buddha does not possess the power to save. He could only point out the truth so that we could find the truth in ourselves. The illusion of soul is one that is very difficult for many of us to understand. The Buddha taught that there is no soul, no essential and permanent core to a living being. Instead, that which we call a living being is a composition of many living pieces, a temporary fusion of many parts. When all of these things are present, the person is alive. And when these things are not there, there's no such thing as a living being anymore. Rebirth occurs without a soul. And the comparison is given that when one lights a candle, a new candle from an old candle, what is past? It's a causal relationship at best. The old candle burns and gives its light to the new candle. There was a causal link, but nothing was transferred. Hindus would believe that what was transferred was the light of the soul. But Buddhists do not believe that there is a soul. And they believe that the illusion of a soul is the root cause of all human suffering. 
that because we believe that we have a soul, that something transcends this life, that we waste the opportunity of fully living this life because of our concern for what comes in the next. The illusion of soul manifests itself as ego, and the natural function of ego is to control. It desires satisfaction, but dis experiences discontent. Suffering cannot end until one sees through deep and powerful meditation that the ideas of me and mine are an illusion. And I've written something here that's been in development for me for a while, with me for a while. But the concepts of self and possessions are illusions. Expressions of our desire to see permanence where there is only impermanence and transition. There is no me, therefore nothing can ever be mine. If there is no me, nothing can be mine. We don't possess anything. What we have, we have for a short period and then goes on. There is no permanence to anything that we see or anything that we have or anything that we are. There are four stages on the path to nirvana. The first one is the stream enterer. This is a stage where someone goes back and, and sees that, that they have, after a lifetime of praying and meditation, have entered the stream and that they're finally at, at greater peace. And they start to eliminate the idea of self. On the second return, your concentration becomes stronger and your mind becomes more tranquil and you another, have another direct insight into self. This is when you start to separate knowing truth and self as a concept to really feeling it and believing it. And this creates a significant reduction in attachment to oneself. When we believe that there is a self, we become attached to things, and this is what causes distress. This is what causes our soul to become sick. When someone dies from our life, when someone passes, we recognize that at that moment that we've become too attached to this person, that we've attached to them something that was possessive. They were mine, and they were never yours. They were simply meant to be for a period and then to move on. Stage three is the never returner, someone who has been able to conquer all of those feelings of hatred, of jealousy and ignorance, and they completely drop away. Drop away. And this person is called the never returner because this person will next seek and achieve nirvana and enlightenment. This stage is rarely accompanied with excitement, so you're not thrilled about achieving this. You just are. It's, uh, I think, very common when we see my father is 96 and he lives with us. And I see elements of this in my father. There's, there's not a lot that excites him anymore, but there's not a lot that bothers him anymore either. He looks at people and smiles and keeps them to himself and recognizes that he's seen a lot and that all of these things will pass. And then Ahat Nirvana, which is the stage where we have achieved the slipping away from all of this desire and the slipping away from all of the suffering of this world. At this point, the consequences of life no longer have any hold over you. Nirvana literally means the blowing out, the quenching, the becoming extinguished. It is the last of our stages where we are at complete peace. In nirvana, you know you're in nirvana when you no longer wish for it. So, when will you know you're in heaven? When will you know you're at peace? When you no longer wish for it. How to become a Buddhist. I know our time is running out here, but I'm going to run through this quickly. It's easy, folks. If you want to become a Buddhist, all you have to do is say, I believe in the ways of the Buddha. But, there are some other methods that you can attach yourself to, following the Buddha, following Dharma, the path, and then Sangha, which are people who guide you through the path. The Buddha is the historical Buddha, but also the lessons of Buddhahood. It means committing yourself to achieving enlightenment through the path. Dharma means following the ways of the teachings of the Buddha and the truth that he understood. And it has many ways, but it, also, it mostly means that you should be seeking to follow and to achieve an enlightened mind. Dharma also refers to following the canon. If you think the Bible is big, the canon of Buddhist literature is a hundred times as long as the Bible. So if you're interested, one of the great books for those of you who are working with people who are in their last 
uh, days, uh, hospice care, anything like that, is the Tibetan Book of the Dead, a wonderful book that helps us deal with the passing of one, a loved one. The goal of Buddhists is to commit to constant learning and practicing the ways of the Buddha. Constant improvement and learning should be our goal. The goal is to be mindful and to achieve enlightenment, but today many Buddhists are not so much in concerned about uh, achieving nirvana as they are about achieving a better next life. The Sangha are our role models. Every one of us, if we're successful in business, has probably had a mentor. And if you're going to be successful in Buddhism, you must also have a mentor. Finding someone to help you with your personal growth is essential to this stage. <clears throat> Buddha, is a ta Buddha taught openly during his lifetime. His teachings were propagated by his followers, and now there are many, many schools of thought in Buddhism. These evolved into many traditions today. The well-known are Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism is the one that we see most because many of us are familiar with the Dalai Lama. There are some special features of Tibetan Buddhism, mainly the status of the teacher or the Lama, focus on the relationship between life and death. This is where the Tibetan Book of the Dead comes from. It's a wonderful book. The importance of rituals and initiations. These faiths do well what most faiths do well, which is traditions and initiations. Mantras and meditation practice. For those who have ever said the word Aum, this is a Buddhist principle for meditation. Supernatural beings are prominent in Tibetan Buddhism. There are many, many interesting gods in Tibetan Buddhism. I encourage you to take a look if you get a chance. The best known face of Tibetan Buddhism is the Dalai Lama, who has lived in exile since he was uh, since he left his country when the Chinese occupied it in 1959. <clears throat> and I'd like to close with one thought from the Dalai Lama. When asked what surprised him about humanity the most, the Dalai Lama replied, man himself, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices his money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and then dies never really having lived. Thank you.